joining me now, joining me now is Carl Kennedy, who is part of a great new band called the Four Fifties. Welcome to the show, Carl. Thanks for having me on. Uh, now <clears throat> I can't me. wait to talk to you about the Four Fifties, but uh, I always like to kind of start off about uh, what some of a musician's earliest influences were. Like, what's some of the music that you remember hearing? Maybe even when you were a really little kid. What was some of the music that had the earliest influence on you? Uh, the Beatles, of course. Uh, watched sure. them when I was, I think I was nine or ten. Watched them on Ed Sullivan, and uh, yeah. that was it. You know, like it was for millions of other drummers. And um, of course, then later on, you know, it was a Vanilla Fudge, Carmine Apice, Blue Cheer, um, you know, Cream, Ginger Baker, Mitch Mitchell, Keith Moon, and of course, I got to study with Carmine Apice and. Uh, and that just changed everything for me. And I also studied with Tony Williams, who was an early influence, but Carmine was the huge influence and, uh, and studying with him just changed my drumming life. I really, up until that point, hadn't really taken formal lessons. I had a drum teacher early on who told me I sucked and I'd never be any good. <laughs> and so eventually I stopped taking lessons from him. So when I got yeah, to that, Carmine, that sounds like, like the right approach. Yeah, that definitely yeah. seems like the right approach. Uh, yeah. What was it about the drums? Was it, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you could have decided the guitar, you could have picked up anything, but what about the drums just really appealed to you? That's a, that's a really good question. When I was four and a half, I went to a wedding reception with my mother and there was a tank in front of the American Legion building where the reception was being held. And walked in and it was, you know, an American Legion. So it's a little low stage and it had two gates like a cross, but there was a opening in the center. And in the center was this red drum set. And all I remember was like the white lights shone down and Alleluia singers. And literally from that moment on, I was obsessed with drums. So it was just literally my whole life. You know, I still am obsessed with drums, but, but uh, that was it from that point on. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you talked about seeing the Beatles on uh, Ed Sullivan and uh, it, it's great that, uh, you know, it was obviously the, the rock music from that show. I mean, you could have ended up a, a plate spinner, maybe doing some puppets like Topo Gigio, you know, but Topo uh, Gigio, that's right. Could have done that. <laughs> <clears throat> but, uh, I, you know, I felt like I of... had a, being in some bands, being in some bands I've been in, I felt like I've been speaking to Topo Gigio at different times <laughs> in my career. <laughs> Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the Beatles and, and drumming, since you brought it up, I mean, you know, it seems like it's a very easy thing for people to to rag on on Ringo. But obviously, mm -hmm. you know, the Beatles wouldn't be the Beatles. I mean, with, you know, a different drummer. Sure, they, they could have sounded different. But I mean, as a drummer, uh, just let's uh, take a moment to give Ringo some credit when, uh, you know, it, I mean, the Beatles shouldn't need credit. But at the same time, no, you but know, somehow it, it, I agree. Yeah. Ringo. Ringo got some kind of a bad rap along the way. His rep got took a big hit. I think it's because just like with Charlie Watts, their technique was it was all about music and feel. It wasn't about chops. Yeah. And I think as time went on, you know, drummers were getting very a lot of finesse and so on. And <clears throat> excuse me, I think for me, and I I've said this to students and people I know who diss Ringo, and I say, you know, I could teach you Ringo's basic beat. Like a doom ba doom doom ba doom ba doom doom ba. In probably an hour, I could have you playing some version of that. Right. I played that one of the first things I ever played. It's taken me 50 years to not even get close to it, just to approximate it, and still can't play it the way Ringo plays it with that feel. So it's deceptive, but Ringo had a pulse, a groove. His fills are unbelievably cool. Um, you know, what can you say? The guys, and he's been acknowledged now, finally, by great yeah. drummers. But but no no doubt about it. And the stuff he played was innovative. And the fact that I'm a left-handed, I'm left-handed also, but I play right-handed. And, you know, what he's saying about how your brain thinks differently, it's true. And uh, with Ringo, now everybody plays open-handed. Um, or should be able to play open-handed. But back then, it wasn't the case. So Ringo was left-handed, and that made some interesting fills for him as well because of the way he would lead off so but yeah ringo is ringo and charlie watts as much as i love so many drummers technical drummers ringo and charlie watts are my top like if i had to name three drummers that i could only listen to for the rest of my life it would be ringo charlie watts and john bonham 
Yeah. Well, I mean, it's uh, it's it's almost like if there were only ever three drummers to do all the drumming and all the music, I think those guys could have covered everything, you know. And uh, yeah, I mean, and Charlie Watts, of course, he just always he somehow just always looked so cool. It was like I don't, you know, it, it, I'm sure there's so photos relaxed. of him sweating. Yeah, there's I'm sure mm -hmm. there's photos of him sweating somewhere, but it looked like he never broke a sweat. He's just like, no, nah, I'm just here, you know, back here. You, you guys go ahead and do everything, you know. I got this yeah. back here, but. Uh, so your uh, band, The Rods, uh, first started putting out records uh, about 40 years ago, and you mm -hmm. have continued to release uh, albums under that band name and solo stuff. But explain how the 450s come about and uh, how you got to working with the guys in the 450s. Well, we go back a ways. The 450s, the guys, the two brothers, the Jacob brothers, Bob and Jim. Um, I worked with them in St. James. In fact, I was the de facto drummer. Every time we would do a session, their drummer was like Spinal Tap. Like one time the drummer <laughs> was, they fired him because he was, he was, we were trying to record and he had a little portable TV and he was on his cell phone with his mother placing bets. And they're like, what? And so finally they said, okay, go home. <laughs> Another drummer came in and I have it on YouTube. If you go to my YouTube page, there's a angry band girlfriend where, he came up, he took photos. We were about to record start, or start working on pre-production. His girlfriend flipped out. And it is the funniest thing because she kept calling back on voicemail. So I recorded it and I put it on YouTube, but he had to go home because his girlfriend. And then another time we were ready to record crimes of the heart and we had done pre-production and we were just ready to play. And the drummer got sick. And then of course gave it to me. So I had this dengue fever. He left, he was gone. And I came down, it was sad in Utica where I had my recording studio and they were lodging upstairs. And I came down and uh, knocked it out in like four hours. And they said that they still remember me lying under the console, listening to playback because I was so sick and then going back out to play the drum tracks. And uh, so for St. James. Oh, I lost you there. You you were tell you're still talking, but uh, I'm there we go. The okay. Oh, there you yeah, go. You're I, back. Okay, great. Right. So we had been friends, and I had produced them, and you know we've been friends for years. So in that course of time, Young Turk, another band from Miami that I produced and managed, and they were on Geffen and Virgin, and uh, they wound up uh, becoming friends. So all these years, we've all been friends, and so it was decided that uh, maybe we should work together, and. Uh, that's how it came about. We've known each other and we've all been friends for a lot of years. But, uh, and this is the first time that uh, this permutation, all these guys all together, this is the first time you guys actually are like, all right, let's uh, try and uh, put yeah. out uh, this album. And the 450s album exactly right. is mm -hmm. produced by uh, Jack Douglas, which uh, must be a great opportunity when you consider, you know, some of the albums that he's worked on. I mean, it depends on the day, but my favorite album of all time might actually be Aerosmith Rocks. So mm -hmm. when you, you know, when you get the, the guy who's got his fingerprints on that. So how did you, uh, I mean, just from being in the business a while, did you know Jack or uh, how did he happen to I mean, become involved in this? We've kind of traveled in different circles. I've never actually met him, but, okay. um, you know, we have mutual acquaintances. And I think this was a case of uh, Bob, the bass player, reached out to Jack and, uh, discussed it with him and Jack actually mixed the album along with Chris Collier and Jay, his, uh, his associate. But um, the one thing we noticed with, with Jack was he had certain things that he would accentuate and pull out, but he is a brilliant guy. And uh, we were glad to have him involved in the project because it's much, much better for it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a little later, I'll ask you about uh, some of the records you worked on as a producer, but kind of talk about just your knowledge and the importance of having a producer that kind of really gets the music that uh, that you guys are actually going for. And uh, it must have uh, it must have helped for uh, him to feel that way about it. Well, it's really critical to have that. You have to have that trust. And of course, we knew that he his track record spoke for itself. So there was no sure. issue in trust. Um, <laughs> but then you see you can Kind of let them, you know, you let the producer, if you have trust with the producer, you let them do what they do because that's why you've hired them. And so you basically sit back and you kind of watch what they do and you trust that their, their suggestions and their vision is correct and you don't second guess it. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, that's what you get. And, uh, you know, we're really happy that he had some very good musical suggestions. 
Well, uh, let's talk about the song that's out there, uh, Flowers for Columbine, which uh, is, a, is it's a great title. Uh, there's a video for it on the 450s YouTube page. Uh, but uh, just uh, tell us a little bit about that song. And uh, if, if you can, uh, uh, however much you're comfortable saying about the title. I know sometimes people don't want to, you know, let us behind the curtain, but uh, it, it is an interesting title. So I was kind of wondering about it. You know, Rhett is the singer and he's the lyricist. Mm -hmm. and, and he's phenomenal and his lyrics are all they're all based on events and people he knows he didn't even change the names in this so i think it was his observation of the fact that uh, these things happen and his experiences like geo for example geo was, was a friend of his and uh, you know wound up ODing, and so Living in Miami, you know, you see a lot of this type of thing, the violence, the casualties, the drug. And he's just a great lyricist, and he's great at bringing things to life, to animate them in his stories, in his lyrics when he sings. So um, I thought it was an interesting version of the song that he came up with. Yeah. And uh, for our uh, visual listeners, you can actually see the uh, video right now, but otherwise you can go to the 450s uh, YouTube page. Now, uh, is, uh, I, you know, that the room that you guys are in, it looks like it could be a studio. It also just might be a little room that uh, a music room you guys are playing in. Is this a recording studio or is this just you guys mm. uh, playing it for the video? We recorded in that studio. And if you watch the video, a little bit mm -hmm. of trivia, there are clown heads up above behind me. Behind me. Okay. Yeah. We'll take, I'll, I'll look for the next there. I, oh, I saw you, but oh, I do. I see some heads back there. Uh, they, I guess that's behind. They me. are yeah. the original. They are the original killer clowns from outer space. The original <laughs> from the movie. Wow. But it's okay. a, but it's a studio. And despite all the crap that's in the room, it's a great sounding room. And so that's what we recorded. In fact, what happened was the night we were, I was to go to the writing session. We were all meeting in Atlanta for a writing session. I had injured my shoulder. I can't remember what was up, but something was, I couldn't sit. I was just in that kind of, when you injure your shoulder, your back, you know, you're mm -hmm. just in agony and you can't sit. I couldn't get on the plane. So everybody else met and they wrote the songs and which was fine because honestly, I think, you know, maybe I would have, uh, putting my fingers in the pie might not have helped anything. I think we were better off just letting Rhett, Rhett and Jimmy work on the material themselves. So great songs. So when I got to Miami, I really didn't hear the material, hadn't heard the material really. So we ran it down and I made a couple of suggestions, but very minor for arrangements and we just knocked it out. So what you're hearing is everybody playing live and that, which is an unusual concept because look, you got five musicians in a room all playing live together, count it off, play, end at the same time. It's like a novel thing. I don't do that anymore because I record my drums here at home. And, right. uh, you know, so this was a great experience. Bob and I, all those tracks are live. And I think it gives it an urgency, a feel that we wouldn't have had if had we done it uh, remotely. Yeah, no, and I mean, I think that uh, that was <clears throat> the noteworthy thing about it is that, uh, you know, you see everybody's actually there playing together and especially uh, musicians I've talked to that have recorded material over the last year and a half. It seems like it's been much more common for people to just send each other the the different tracks and, you know, files <clears throat> back and Excuse forth me. and mm -hmm. working together on Zoom and all that. So, uh, yeah, but I think that... Uh, you know, I'm I'm not a musician, but I've listened to enough music that uh, there's definitely times where you can tell the difference between, you know, guys in a room together uh, and, you know, it can all be good. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, for the song that I've heard, it seems like it's uh, it's it's well represented that uh, everybody actually got together. Uh, so the band is on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and even Linktree at the 450s band. So those are all places you can do. Uh, you, those are all places you can go to to find information on how to pre-order the album. Now, I love the name of the record label. Uh, take a moment to talk about Louder Than Loud Records, which is one of those great names because it tells you everything you need to know. Uh, and you're actually one of the founders of that label. I am Giles Giles Lavery, who manages B, The Rods. Um, he manages Kennedy, The 450s. He um, he and I discussed starting a label. And so this came about um, 
we talked with Bob and we decided that maybe we should start a label and uh, but which is so complicated and so involved and so financially onerous you know it's it's not an easy thing to put all the pieces together but um, we said you know what maybe we should do it and um, and so that's what we did we decided we would have the control and louder than loud was a song title that um, you know i had for the last rods album brotherhood of metal and uh, so giles suggested that we use that and i thought we all thought that's a brilliant name for the label it's perfect and exactly what what we need for a label title you know for the name of the label yeah and uh and so you uh you you signed yourself to it the 450s are on it and uh but mm -hmm. uh, what i was reading in the notes is that there's also the idea of you know looking for some archival stuff that maybe needs to be reissued and that sort of stuff so that must be uh you know a fun process we, to try and figure out it is we have some projects coming that we'll be announcing that i think people right. will be excited about so uh, in terms of the 450s in particular, uh, are there Excuse plans me. for, obviously plans for performing live are uh, very complicated right now. Uh, some people do it. Some people think they're going to do it and then realize they can't do it. And, uh, and you know, there's all these different ways to do mm -hmm. it. So uh, are there plans for a live show somewhere later this year, next year? What are, what are you guys thinking? We, we keep talking and trying to bounce ideas. We're talking about maybe doing some shows in Connecticut, Atlanta, mm -hmm. Miami. It's, you know, it's tough because it's tough to get a footing because you set a date and then people are canceling tours, concerts yeah. and so on. And then others go off without a hitch, but it's just a question of, you know, for us, we live in different areas regionally, geographically, we are distance. And so as a result of that, in order for it to bring us all together, it's three airfares plus whatever. So. You know, we keep trying to logistically work it out, and hopefully we will. We all want to play. I love to play these songs yeah. live. So we'll see. I mean, we're hoping we can get something together soon. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, live performances, uh, I was kind of, uh, you know, when we were talking earlier about, you know, you were seeing the, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. What was the first concert you went to that had an impact? It might, maybe not the first time you saw live music, but uh, do you remember early on going to a show that uh, just really blew you away? I do. It was uh, the animals. And uh, I remember being backstage and, you know, the drums were there and they were a small kit. I remember that, but at the time I thought it was really cool. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then the roadies like, come on guys, stay back. You know, but we we're all like, look at this, you know, look at this <laughs> gear, look at this. But, you know, that was a great show. I, and I still love all those animal songs, you know, don't let me be misunderstood. Um, don't bring me down. Um, you know so many of those great songs when i was young it's still a great there's just so many of them in fact i did a remake of um, don't bring me down and uh, so you know that'll come out at some point just did it for this oh, cool. for myself mm -hmm. uh in terms of uh your own history performing live uh i have to ask about uh the rods open for ozzy on the blizzard of oz tour so uh, just even being backstage and, and hearing Randy Rhodes every night. I mean, that must have been uh, crazy to just uh, just be in the building, you know. Well, the first night we did the Landmark Theater in Syracuse and we we're in our dressing room, <clears throat> excuse me, and suddenly we hear this riffing, which now, of course, is very common to hear someone play like Ingve or Randy Rhodes, but yeah, not sure. the way he played in Ozzy. It was a whole different thing. And so to hear it, Steve Vai kind of playing or Satriani. And that's what we were hearing. And it was totally new to us. We just hadn't heard anyone play that kind of blazing sweep picking and incredible stuff. And it was so loud. He must have had a half a Marshall stack in his dressing room. <laughs> but we literally couldn't. We would talk and our lips would move. We couldn't hear anything we said. That's how loud it was in our dressing room. So you can imagine where Randy was. <laughs> but the nicest guy, you know, everybody on the tour was cool. Um, at least that first night. And I remember it was a big thrill for me because I was a big um, Tommy Aldridge fan and, you know, stole so much from him, including I used to wear wristbands, which I no longer do. I once in a great while, but, but I used to wear wristbands all the time, and uh, which I thought were a great idea when you're, you're sweating. And uh, I remember playing my drum solo and I see um, Tommy Aldridge looking through the side curtain watching me play and i was like oh my god this is the coolest thing with my idols 
And then, of course, he darted back and, you know, I didn't see him again. So, so but anyway, it was a, it was great. You know, it was great to be on on those dates. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I can I can imagine to, uh, you know, just <laughs> to have that sort of. Uh, yeah, I like the description of it being that loud backstage. So you can only imagine. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, uh, and, uh, you know, earlier I did reference the fact that you worked as a producer. And, you know, when I was reading about that, uh, you worked with uh, Anthrax a number of times. But the most interesting thing I found is that you convinced them to get rid of the singer that they were working with and then ultimately brought in Joey Baldana. But talk about just being able to say to, I don't, I don't know how well you knew the guys, but to be like, look, this just isn't going to work with the guy you've got. Uh, and then obviously you continued to work with them. So I, they must've uh, appreciated your honesty. I think so. From the first time I met Anthrax, they were young and talented and, you know, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to be able to work with, those kind of musicians. But I saw in them a focus and a drive similar to what I had. And uh, so when they, we did the Fistful of Metal album, Neil was phenomenal. And Neil Turbin is still phenomenal. Uh, however, when they went off and went on the road, it was not, they just didn't mesh apparently. So when they came back, um, Neil was gone and they had this Matt um, Fallon, Fallon, I'm not sure. I have yeah, to her, yeah, he'd been in Skid Row at one point. I mean, I guess that's after this, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So Matt, yeah. Matt was with them, and uh, but and then Dan Looker was gone. Dan Looker was so brilliant, you know, obviously Nuclear Assault and SOD, and Dan was gone. So now you know it was a whole different thing. So Frank came in, and Frank was just the nicest guy, and and you know Frank was a little inexperienced, but you know he got up to speed fast. But Matt was young and I think he was just, he was partying and, you know, what I said to the guys after the week was, you know, this guy, this isn't the singer's going to get you to the major label. You have to remember that that time they weren't on Island. They did not have a major label. They were with right. Megaforce and they were trying to get to a major label. So true to form, these guys were focused. So despite the risk, the terror of not having a singer, oh my God, this is, we've got to finish it no matter what. They said, well, you know, give Johnny a call. So I called Johnny, told him how I felt. Johnny said, put them on the phone. I sent them into the conference room. Three minutes later, they walk in and said, John wants to talk to you. And I go, hey, John. And he goes, put him on a bus. And he hung up. <laughs> that was it. It was done. And so then we had no singer. And so I reached out to looking around and, you know, trying to network and I reached out to um, Andrew Duck McDonald, the guitarist that uh, he and I did the Thrasher album together. And so he suggested Joey. And so I called Joey and we brought him in and uh, yeah, it was magic. I mean, it was a, Joey had been singing basically Steve Perry journey type of music, but somehow when he came in and started learning the anthrax songs and singing them, it was, you know, I hate to say magical, but it was, it was really special. And uh, there was no doubt that there was a, the synergy that came from that chemistry that what he brought to the songs and for my money, taking nothing away from the great singers in, in the band, Joey is the voice of anthrax for me. Yeah. Yeah. And just think about what it did for his career to not continue to sing like Steve Perry. You know, I think, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, Steve Perry can't sing like, sing like Steve, Steve Perry. Perry anymore. That's right. That's right. Sadly, <laughs> so, Steve Perry can't sing like Steve Perry. Yeah. But he certainly exactly. gave it a good run for a lot of years. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Uh, and then the, uh, the last thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, I also read that you worked with Ronnie James Dio and uh, you know, he, it's, it's sort of well known that uh, he could nail a song on the first take. Now, did you find that to be the case uh, or uh, you know, did it to take a little bit of, you know, did you have to do two takes? No, David had told me for years early on with the elves and elf, the bass player in the band I was in, we rehearsed in the Finnish garage area. Mm -hmm. And they were elf rehearsed in the house because the guitarist and bass player from the two different bands roomed together. So that's where the bands rehearsed. So I would see those guys back then and I knew them and they would come out to see, you know, the band I was in. But uh, I didn't really ever do a recording session or wa watch a recording session with Ronnie, but David would always tell me that. 
Okay. Ronnie was a one take guy. Well, he's a one take guy. So, you know, Ronnie's David's cousin, Ronnie, you know, they were in bands together. I mean, David almost joined Dio, the later version of Dio. Uh, Ronnie asked him to come back and uh, he was just unable to because of his commitments. He has a restaurant and his children were young and he was going to, but you know, at the end, it just, those pressures were too much, but you know, I would hear this and I would think, well, you know what? He's your family. You love him. You know, like the memories, like was he, you know, really a one take? I'm like, yeah, I've worked with so many great singers. Nobody's a one take. <laughs> Just not the way it right. is, you know? You can't, to get phrasing, timing, intonation and so on. That's a bitch, you know, to get that all in one. So Ronnie came in and it's exactly what he did. And now when he sang The Code, which was a song that I wrote, right. I was... He's like, well, Carl, I'm, you know, I'm going to make a little change here. Is that okay? I'm like, carte blanche, Ronnie. Like, what am I, <laughs> what am I going to say? There's this crappy vocal that I did as the demo, right? For him to have, it was yeah. embarrassing enough for him to have to listen to it. And then for him to af- have to ask, but that's how kind he was, you know, to ask and respectful to ask my permission to change something a little bit in my song, the melody a little bit, or the way he phrased the words. And, uh, but that was it. Then he sang it. And he, one time he said, I'm going to re-sing it, but I want to sing it differently. And so the one time he did it, a second take, it was not to correct, but to change. And it, I was in awe. I, and then he was singing Metal Will Never Die. One take. And uh, it, it was like, wow, you weren't <laughs> kidding. He goes, see, I told you. I'm like, yeah, but I thought after all these years, you know, your memory kind of faded about it. And, you know, you always kind of, painted a rosy picture and uh and now it's true he was at least my experience watching him on two songs yeah. one take and and unreal unreal what he brought to it i mean he and i said ronnie i can't believe he goes yeah that's what i do i'm a singer like very yeah, humble. well i love you i love what you said in that uh you know he asked if it was all right you know like you're gonna be like ronnie don't ruin my song what are you doing here you know yeah <laughs> but, no uh, hey, dude dude listen that's you know my lyrics my melody and uh, we're not changing anything, you know, get it right. And, uh, you know, it's like, it was like, but it was so respectful. It took me by surprise. And of course, you know, I was just so happy. And it wasn't yeah. like he took, did crazy license, but he just improved it. Just the little things he did improved it so much. Yeah. You know, no, no. Really, definitely. really it was a genius at what is his craft. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, as I mentioned, we've been talking to Carl uh, Kennedy. Uh, the band is the 450s. They're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Linktree, the 450s band. So go to any of those places or all those places and you can find more information on how to pre-order the album. Uh, is there an uh, expected date that uh, the album will be ready for people or uh, is it uh, November? Just... No, November 19th. November 19th. So, is the release date. So, mm-hmm. so less than a month and uh, you'll be able to get it at uh, all those places. Well, Carl, it's been uh, nice getting to meet you and uh, great talking to you. And I look forward to hearing more from the four fifties. You too. And thank you for the support. Absolutely. Thanks again, uh, Carl Kennedy.